It's Ready News Review with America's independent voice. As far as we know, he's going to be reelected. Rob Rob Rick- Barack Obama has been reelected. I so wish that I had been able to fulfill your hopes to lead the country in a different direction, but the nation chose another leader. You know, I, I like whipping people. Do I need to whip you too? I hope not. Maine, more than a collection of red states and blue states, we are and forever will be the United States of America. Pressing news that you need to know. I'm not concerned with what you think you need to know. I'm not concerned with what you might want reported and the way you might want it reported. Voted one of the top ten favorite talk show hosts in America. I am interested in getting people to open up their eyes to the political system and understand that systematic change is needed, and that's the only way we're going to get the change. He's the undisputed king of independent talk. It's Rob Ritten. This is Ready News Review. The show. What now? 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 I'm Rob Redding, America's independent voice. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the most talked about show on talk radio. This is the show they talk about. This is the show that they fear. This is Redding News Review Unrestricted, and this is the weekend edition. We've got quite a bit to get over into this broadcast, and we are going to get started very, very succinctly with brand new news that's out there about the Department of Justice leaning toward not indicting. Darren Wilson on any charges against Michael Brown. And this is a story that's at the top of the website at readingnewsreview.com. For all of you that have web subscriptions, you've been on the site and you know that this is one of the top stories. We'll also talk about today what's going on with the President of the United States and why he, in an interview with YouTube, talks very frankly about bias, but this escaped any mention whatsoever in the State of the Union address. And then finally, there is a sheriff in town who says that Al Sharpton, long hair don't care, is a gutter politician. Welcome to Reading News Review. I'm restricted. I have so much, so much to get to. And we're going to try to get to every single bit of it in this weekend edition. Now, starting with the Department of Justice, there have been so many people that have watched the Michael Brown case closely. And they have said, you know, this is a slam dunk. Darren Wilson, he's not going to get away with this. We're going to march. We're going to protest. We're going to burn down cities. This is what we're going to do until people understand that we're not going to let this young black man die in vain. Unarmed, Michael Brown faced Darren Wilson, who wanted him to stop after walking down the middle of the street just a few months ago. And he was shot down unarmed, and some say he had his hands up. Other witnesses say that he didn't have his hands up. We found out that those other witnesses never actually saw and had links to white supremacy groups. Still, the Department of Justice, in a report, is not pursuing charges against Darren Wilson. Are we shocked at any of this? This is the same Department of Justice that has not formally charged George Zimmerman, has not done anything in the Trayvon Martin case. So are we really surprised That is more blustering and talk from the Obama administration. That's when you can get talk, but we'll get to that in a moment. I I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. That's when you can get talk from these folks. That's the reason reason why I've been saying over and over again that we are holding these folks accountable. I'm going to keep my foot in in, in the crack and crevices of their rear end until they get that we're going to have justice. Now, you know, I've said over and over again, 
I don't know whether Darren Wilson's going to go down for this. And I've said over and over again, it really has nothing to do with Darren Wilson's race. It has nothing to do with the fact that he's a white officer. He could be a black officer. And we're going to see an example of that, that some of these folks that are in the system, that are plugged into the system, all right, that are black, with it be it the Oscars, with it being the police, with it being the presidency, they are there to do the bidding of white supremacist racists. That's what they are there to do, and that's exactly what they do. So it doesn't make a difference what color the officer was that shot Michael Brown. Okay, some people made it a race issue. It's not a race issue. All right, not 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 as pure and simple on the surface as that. The officer could have been black. Okay, what if it had been a black officer? It wouldn't have changed a thing for me. It still would be a cause for what we've seen. It still would be a cause for what we've seen in terms of protest, the level of protest. And the only reason, as I said before, and I will say again, Ferguson received the amount of attention it did is because Ferguson was ground zero for race rioting. That's why. Because dogs were trained on protesters, because protesters were gassed, because journalists who were reporting on it were locked up, and it took days and days for this to happen before the mainstream media actually put this on the 24-hour news drip. It didn't just happen immediately. They were cutting a fool, the police were cutting a fool in Ferguson for some time before, it was about two, two to three days. Uh, there was on the third day of them cutting a fool that they finally put it on television. Now, I haven't gotten too far into the fact that Michael Brown was high out of this world, and I've told you that you cannot walk the streets of America and be black in America high out of your mind because there are too many things that black men face. There are too many, as President Obama says a little bit later on in the broadcast, there are too many biases that black men face for young black men to walk the streets and be high out of their minds and expect to live. These are life and death decisions. I'm being honest here, making sure this is on. These are life and death decisions that these young people are making, and they don't even realize it. They don't realize the dangers and pitfalls, the tolls and snares. It used to, it used to be told in church, the tolls and snares that are out there that oppose them. They don't understand that there is a serious world out there in which if they make the wrong decisions and they're not lucid in their decisions, they can get locked up and the key will be thrown away. They can get their, their behinds beat. They can be, be shot down in the middle of the street like dogs, like Michael Brown, and no one will think any more about it. And let me give you some examples of no one thinking anything more about it. Young man in Utah shot down. Shot down in cold blood. No one thinks any more about it because no one rioted. Young man out in California, Zell Ford, shot down. And no one thinks anything more about it. Why? Because there wasn't rioting. Tamir Rice, Cleveland, shot down. Playground. No one really thinks anything more about it because there wasn't rioting. Eric Garner, just choked out New York City. No one thinks anything more about it. My point is, is that what got our attention, what captured the imagination, and what made Eric Holder, all right, get on that plane, because we knew Barack Obama wasn't. Hell, Barack Obama wouldn't even get on a plane to go to Paris, and most people are dying to get on the plane to go to Paris. Anytime you say, going to Paris? Oh, I'm on that plane. When are we leaving? President Obama didn't even want to go to Paris, didn't go to Paris, when there was uproar about the murder of the journalist in Paris and the problems with Muslims in Paris. We know President Obama, who spent his time on the golf course, wasn't going anywhere. So what got Eric Holder on that plane, let's be clear, was to tamp down and to appease these black people and stop them from rioting. What was the first thing that President Obama said when the rioting happened? He said, you've got to respect the verdict. We've got to respect the decision of the grand jury. 
it was the same thing he said with Sean Bell in New York. We've got to respect a verdict. And let's be clear, those people out there who say that he is the embodiment of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King are doing a disservice to the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders that fought. They fought against injustices. They integrated lunch counters when it was against the law. They rode their way to freedom on buses. And then when they couldn't, they decided to walk. The point is, at the end of the day, these folks that he stands on the shoulders of, President Obama stands on the shoulders of, these folks that Eric Holder stands on the shoulders of, they belittle the legacy of these individuals every single day, at every single turn, and every single one of these news stories, which is why I am not surprised that the DOJ has tentatively, from what we understand, reached this decision from the reports that we have from what we posted on the website. You know, I I saw the headline earlier this week, and I didn't want to believe it. And now it's starting to really sink in that it's not happening. The Department of Justice has failed us. But are we surprised based on the fact that these folks just wanted to go away? President Obama wants it to go away. President Obama doesn't want to address this. And with that being said, let's get into the second part of this here. He... He is, and this is the second story, he is interviewed by a woman who looks like she is watermelon lips. And and that's the best way I can put it, watermelon lips. I'm sure you probably know who this woman is. Her name is Glozella Green. She wants to talk to President Obama about the popo. You think I'm joking. I'm not saying popo. That's what she said. This is... She is a YouTube star. Get this. YouTube had three of its YouTube stars sit down with President Obama. These are people with millions and millions of subscribers on YouTube. These are people that are on YouTube that have millions and millions of subscribers. These are characters that have risen to some kind of semblance of popularity uh, via the mosh pit. And these folks have been elevated to a level that President Obama sits down with them at the White House and gives them serious interviews. Serious, serious interviews. I'm serious when I say serious. These are serious interviews. Glozella Green, like her name, is dressed in green, and she has green lipstick caked on. She looks like she's got two watermelon lips. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's not just a subtle green. It's a, it's a neon. It's a bright neon green that she is wearing on her lips. And it's funny because President Obama, you can see he's just kind of laughing. He's laughing in his mind. As a matter of fact, I think I'll post a video of it. You can see it on the website at RainNewsReview.com. I'll post it where you can watch the whole interview. There's a series of three interviews President Obama does. During the interview with Glozella Green, who, of course, is a black woman, uh, how, you know, we're colorful people, right? So I'm not sure why we need to have colored. Uh, okay. Anyway, I, I'm not going to digress. Glozella Green asked President Obama about police. She's the only one that asked him about police and the deaths and what he plans to do about the police and black people. Listen. I have three family members who are in the law enforcement. Uh-huh. And my husband, who... Painted, painted that, that yes. yes. He's retired from the Air Force. Well, we, we're grateful for his service. You tell him thank you. I will do that. Okay. However, he's mad at me right now uh-huh. because I cut all the hoods off his hoodies. <laughs> I did. I did that for I real understand. to protect him because yeah. I'm afraid when he goes outside right. that somebody might shoot and kill him. And it's not like regular folks. It's the popo. I hope that... This changes. How can we bridge the gap between black African-American males and white cops? Well, first of all, you know, we always have to just remind ourselves that uh, the overwhelming majority of police officers, they are doing a really tough job and they're doing it well and they're doing it professionally. Uh, what we also know is that there's still biases in our society that in split-second situations where people are having to make quick decisions, that studies have shown African-American males are seen as more threatening. 
which puts them in more vulnerable positions. Yes. Young African-American males are typically seen as older than they are. Uh, and so a lot of the way to solve this is to improve training so people can be aware of their biases ahead of time. And when I was in the state legislature uh, back in Illinois, for example, I passed a, a racial profiling bill. It essentially uh, said, how are we going to tackle this problem? Let's make sure we're keeping track of the race of everybody that was being stopped. And just by the small uh, fix of keeping track, suddenly each cop, when they were about to make a traffic stop, they had to think, okay, am I stopping this person because I should be stopping them, or is some bias at work? And just that kind of mindfulness about it ended up resulting in better uh, data, better policing, more trust uh, by the communities that are affected. And we can do some of that same, uh, th that same stuff and use those same tools. I've put together a task force with police and community activists, including some of the young people who were uh, actively involved in the Ferguson protests, to make sure that we come up with what are the best training practices, what are the best tools, uh, more uh, body cameras on police officers so that they know they're being watched and, yes. and how they're uh, uh, operating. And we're going to take some of those recommendations and you know, we're going to uh, put federal muscle behind them to see if we can uh, make sure that communities all across the country are implementing. Thank you. There you go. Well, you know, the, uh, it, it's something that I think everybody, not just African Americans or Latinos, but everybody should be concerned about because you get yes. better policing when communities have confidence that uh, the police are protecting and serving all people and not, uh, and not in any way showing bias. And, and that's something that uh, we should all have an interest in. Amen to that. There you go. Okay. okay. It was actually an intelligent question. With the exception of Glozella Green talking about the popo, all right, as a matter of fact, it's funny because, you know, the conservative racist white bloggers out there, not all conservatives are racist, but just the conservative racist white bloggers out there, uh, the headline read, uh, the, the President Obama asked about the popo. You think I'm joking? You think I'm joking? I'm, I'm not joking. President Obama asked about the popo. Uh, she's only keeping it real. She's keeping it real stupid, okay? That, this, see, I keep it real, you know, even though Shopton says he keeps it real. Shopton, you know, long hair don't care. Shopton, he thinks he keeps it real too, you know. But let me just tell you, I keep it real but the fact is, I keep it real intelligent, real cerebral, and talking about the things that you need to know. And I'm not yelling at you when I don't need to. Shopping! And I'm not, you know, ow! Keeping it real, you know, in the background. I'm not doing all of that. And I don't have watermelon lips where I've got them painted green. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going by Glozella Green, you know, Peter Green, Master Green, you know, any of those things. I'm America's independent voice. That's what I do. And, you know, whatever the hustle is for her, however she gets her million YouTube hits by making herself a character and, you know, in, in making fun of herself and coming across like a mammy, that's, that's up to her. You know, that, that's the, 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 the crazy thing about this interview with, with President Obama, and we'll get to what he said in a moment. Glozella Green, when you watch this interview, gives a gift to President Obama, actually gives it to Michelle Obama, Malia, and Sasha. And he gives this glance at her, like, what in the world are you talking about? When she says to him, she says, I want to give it to your first wife. And then she said, first lady. The, the, the thing is, is that she was wrong and she was she almost said baby mama because you know that's kind of the cloth that this woman clearly kind of comes out of with the way she's presenting herself because people judge you based on how you present yourself right so here here's the thing here's the rub here's the rub after the interview she's so mad at herself for fumbling up the first lady is not the f the first wife or of uh, a uh, uh, president obama or, or the first mistress of uh, or the first baby mama, whatever. Maybe she was hoping she could be a baby mama. She was so upset about that, she wasn't upset about the fact that she called the police the popo. She doesn't even understand that people are making fun of her by reporting on her, and when they report on her, that they're making fun of not the fact that she called the first lady, all right, the first wife of your first wife. 
All right, he you know, he's like he, he jokes as a man. I'm not going to take away the joke. You watch the video and see how President Obama comes back on her about it. But I can tell you again <laughs> that that she's upset with herself about the fact that she mangled Michelle Obama. All right, then about the fact that people are laughing at her because she calls the police the popo. Okay, they 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 they're. That's what got the journalist's attention. It wasn't even really the question because President Obama's kind of answered this question or spoke again about this question before when he talked about his task force. And my good friend Charles Ramsey, who's going to be on that task force, who's in that task force as we speak. So he makes the observation here that there is bias in the police forces of this country that there are biases that apply to police officers who are making snap decisions, that there are people out there who, who are doing this stuff, right, who, who, who are in the position and they have badges and they have guns, that are on the streets of our, of our great country and they're policing us and we're expected to arrive alive when we leave our parents' house and when we leave our jobs and when we leave church and when we leave schools and synagogues, wherever we're going, we're expected to arrive alive. But the fact is, sometimes you run into police officers that think that you're reaching too fast for something. That Maybe there's something in the glove compartment that's not just your registration or your wallet. or You you're, you're reach too fast or you... You, we expected you to do something that you're not supposed to do. We expected you to have something you're not supposed to have. Don't, 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 don't move too fast. Telegraph your moves. And even when you do, remember that, that, that guy in Florida that was on camera that we talked about weeks and months ago? Who's on camera who actually told the police officer, I'm going into my truck. I'm going to get, the, I'm going to go get my wallet. I'm going to get the driver's license registration. He still got shot on camera. And then he asked the police officer, why did you shoot me? And the police officer, if he's honest, he would say, because you're black. All right, because you're black. President Obama doesn't do a darn thing wrong in his response. If you're looking for me to, to, to get upset with President Obama, to, to sit up here and, and to pontificate about how President Obama could have answered this question better, I'm not going to do it. He's absolutely right. But here's the sickening part. And here's a sickening part that I have about this all. Is that President Obama is absolutely, positively right. And that doesn't make any sense to some of you, but let me make it clear. President Obama is absolutely right when he talks to Watermelon Lips. What's her name? (laughs) Glozella Green. What a name, Glozella Green. You know. He's absolutely right when he talks to Glozella Green about all of this. He's absolutely right when he talks to BET and says, you know what, there is bias and black people are getting their behinds whipped and and black people are, you guys have all types of issues and we're going to solve, I know about these issues, I know this pain, I understand. He's absolutely right when he sits down with People Magazine and says to People Magazine with Michelle Obama that racism exists, that he has been called a waiter, that he has been called a valet before, that he has been given keys to a car, to park a car, that he has been told to get coffee while he was the President of the United States. Michelle Obama talks about how she goes into a supermarket and, 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 and is asked to get something off the top shelf. Yeah, all of these things are right. Racism is alive in America, alive and well. Absolutely, Mr. President. I absolutely agree with you. Bravo. I'm glad you get it. Here's the problem is that I don't get it. You don't get it. We don't get it. What, what, Rob, what don't we get? What don't we get? Please tell me what we don't get. Please tell me how we don't get it. Please tell me what what am I supposed to see, Rob? What? Please let let me know. Well, we got some time. Relax, relax. You know why you why you're you're trying to listen to this broadcast right now? You're getting pulled over by the police. You're like I can't relax, Rob. I, I'm telling them I'm going into my register, you know, my, my pocket for registration, but I I don't know whether he's going to shoot me while I'm doing it. 
I can't relax, Rob. I'm, I'm on my run. I got you in my ear. I've got both earbuds in, but I'm being stopped and asked, you know, by the police officer, hey, let me see if you got any warrants or holds on you. You live around here? I can't relax, Rob, because I'm walking. I'm walking, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I've got my earbuds in. I'm walking through the store, and they keep following me like I'm about to steal something. I can't relax, Rob, because as, I, uh, as I'm listening to you, I'm at, I'm at work right now, and the police just walked in, and I'm getting nervous because I'm not sure whether they're here for me just because I'm black while sitting. Rob, please tell me, what am I missing? No, I'm, I'm, uh, there are no caveats. I think President Obama saw a message when it comes to black people. The problem is, is the message didn't reach the State of the Union. Let me, let me rewind back. President Obama and everything he says to Glozella Green is absolutely correct. President Obama and what he says to Glozella Green is absolutely correct. I'm going to say it again. Watermelon Lips got something great out of the President of the United States. And she didn't have to use her lips. Okay, fine. That's, that's, that, that, some people didn't get that, but that, that, I'm going to keep going. The point is, she got something great out of the President Obama, all right? She got something great out of the President. Now, here's the problem. Here's the rub. Not against her, against President Obama. We can't get this during the State of the Union. We can't get President Obama saying the state of the union is such where black people in this country do not get treated fairly. Instead, what we get from President Obama is regardless of how you feel about black people and how they're treated in the streets and what your view is and what your view is on cops, we need to have racial healing. This is what we get from President Obama, this type of rhetoric. We don't get straight admissions that this is happening to black people. It's not, in our, it's not in our minds. Some black people feel as if this is happening. Remember, all the rhetoric, you have to follow President Obama's rhetoric. When Michael Brown's death occurred, President Obama didn't say a word. The media didn't cover it. What happened was is there were riots for about 24 to 48 hours. Then once they realized that black people wouldn't settle down about it, they went. Journalists went to Ferguson. They seized on the city of Ferguson. And they reported on the city of Ferguson. And then when they still, a week later, were still riding and telling folks, you know what, this ain't Sanford. We don't turn the other cheek here. We don't allow people to do what you see in Florida. What, what, do we, what was the other story we discussed in Florida this week? The, in Florida where the, the police department was shooting at black suspects, and the only reason why we knew anything about the black suspects on paper, the only thing why we, we knew anything about this is because these people who were shooting, one of the people that started at the shooting range noticed that these were not just black people, but one of them was her brother. Her brother who had turned his life around, as if the other people on the paper hadn't turned their damn lives around. Where she had to, as Dr. Tommy Curry talks about all the time, we have him on this program, she had to humanize her brother and say that her brother was different than every other black person on that piece of paper. You can shoot at them, but you can't shoot at my brother. That's the other thing that, that, that really incensed me about this story. That's the same, really, Sanford-type area, because this was, this was part of just south of, of Sanford, okay? Just south of Sanford, this is part of Miami, part of that area part of South Florida, all right, which is an extension of Georgia with a beach. The mentalities there are different. And, and the defense of the shooting range was, that's right, that there were black officers that were shooting, too, at the targets. There were black officers that were shooting, too, at these targets. So that's the, that's the thing that you need to realize. So that means that it wasn't racial. That we weren't just shooting at these, we just weren't a whole bunch of white police officers shooting at these black people because that is a bad thing. We wouldn't want that. 
There were black officers here, too. I keep telling you, as Dr. Lewis Gordon told you earlier this week, I keep telling you, as Dr. Tommy Curry tells you over and over again, I keep telling you that black faces are used all the time in white supremacy. What did France Fanon via Dr. Lewis Gordon articulate very well that the bourgeoisie would be there, the bougie would be there because – there is a disconnect, there's a chasm, there's a gulf between those that have versus those that have not. And their response would be, I've got mine, you get yours. I don't want to keep going over the same material, but it's applicable material. All right, from Dr. Lewis Gordon's talk from this year that we ran earlier this week. The point is that because these people were different in Ferguson, they weren't like the people in Sanford. They weren't the turn the other cheek. There wasn't, there wasn't a need for a council like in, in Florida to say that you can't use black suspects at shooting ranges. That's what the council had to, to pass. That was the latest update from this week in that particular shooting range incident. In Ferguson, they were very clear about something, that we are not nonviolent Negroes, as I talk about in my book. Not a nonviolent Negro, how I survived Obama. I talk about this. I talk about the fact that I am not a nonviolent Negro, that I believe in violence. And every single time you talk about you believe in violence and you're black, people do a double take because just you showing up is violence, as Dr. Lewis Gordon communicated about Franz Fanon and what Franz Fanon believed. Just you showing up and you being there is violence, as Dr. Tommy Curry points out in his analysis. Just you showing up in the room is violence. All right, why is Trayvon Martin dead? Because what did George Zimmerman say? Because he wasn't supposed to be there. Looks like something's wrong with him, he said in the recordings. Who is he? Why is he here? Doesn't this Negro know better? Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I want to make sure I'm getting through to you. I want to make sure you understand where I'm going. President Obama, when he talks about the state of the disunion, he doesn't mention any of this. He doesn't get in depth. He says, regardless of what you believe, all right, this, this is what we need is we need unity. You know, what well, we needed unity for some time, but to have unity, we have to be on one accord. And the first accord that we need to be on is to understand that black people are inherently treated differently. This is not up for debate. It is not up for discussion. It is not a maybe. See, that is the problem, that many people feel like this is something that's up for debate. This is something that's up for discussion, that there is no bias when it comes to black people. They're not willing to admit that. And then they submit to you that because some officers died, and I'm, uh, my heart goes out to the family, that some officers died in New York, therefore you should shut up, sit down, and stop talking about inherent bias against black people because, darn it, that led to two officers dying by some deranged lunatic who was in the wrong. Like I said, I'm not going to stop talking about Black Lives Matter because two officers in New York are shot by a deranged lunatic who should have been in a straitjacket. I am not going to do that. And I'm not advocating violence by saying that, you know what, we are not going to take people talking about these issues are not important. What I am advocating is for people to understand that racism exists, that it exists in these instances where young black men are encountered by the police. And just because they're encountered by the police doesn't mean they're doing something wrong. They're walking while black. They're talking while black. They're running while black. They're riding while black. That's the only crime that they're committing. And thereby, they are suspects. Why? Because they fit the profile. What's the profile? Well, they look like a drug deal. No, what the profile is is that they're actually black. That's the profile. They fit that profile. That's the issue. So what? They're running with knuckleheads. So what? They've got the car look, looks like they're, 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 they're spinners or they look like they, they, they got somebody in the trunk and they're trying to get out. The music's so loud, it's bumping, boom, 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 boom. So what? Any of that. You've got white boys that ride around every day, the suburbs, and no one bothers them and no one stops them and no one hits them upside the head and no one shoots the hell out of them and no one takes them to jail and no one does anything like that to them. Nobody rides around Beverly Hills the way they ride around Compton. No one rides around, in terms of police patrols, Beverly Hills and locks up young white men the way they lock up young black men in Compton 
or any other part of America. You know, President Obama keeps talking about how we should have more policing in the black community. The fact is, is that black people aren't inherently any worse than white people. But we have more contact with police officers because we're more patrolled by police officers than any other group. And that's the reason why we go to jail at higher rates. That's the reason why we get our behinds beat at higher rates. And that's the reason why we end up dead at higher rates at the hands of police officers. And so when police officers tell you this crap, that we should shut up and sit down, and President Obama acquiesces to it and then tries to make it muddy, as if it's some muddy. Well, we don't really know what's going on, and we really, we're really not sure, but we need to have some unity. Don't make some grand statement, Mr. President, the State of the Union, and pretend like everything's okay, and then get up there and talk to Gonzella Green or Gozella Green or Glozella Green or Nozella Green, whatever the hell her name is, and sit there and talk to her and pretend as if to watermelon lips that it's not okay and that there is a bias. Say that there's a bias at the State of the Union. Say that there's a bias like you tell Glozella Green. Say that there is a bias and that black men are treated fairly. Say that we need training of police officers at the State of the Union. Don't tell us that, you know what, we're not sure what's going on at the State of the Union. Don't, don't tell us that, you know what, we're not sure of what's going on with young black men when the cops are called and when the cops show up. See, I know when, you know, I, I get ready and I get heated about something, and I, that when I call the cops, I know that when I call the cops on someone black, that someone could die. That's the reality. If you've got a man and he gets out of check, ladies, and he gets kind of crazy at your house, you know if you call the police, guess what? As she calls it, the popo. If you call the popo, what's going to happen? He's probably going to go to jail. He might get his behind beat. He might, end up in, he might end up in a pine box. So if you call the police on your husband and he's black or your boyfriend and he's black, you don't know what could happen. This is a last resort for black people in the hood is to call the police on somebody black. But because we know when we, p we pick up that phone, anything can happen. Anybody can go to jail. Hell, you can go to jail. You're taking your life into your own damn hands. And this man is sitting up here in, in front of the State of the Union talking about, well, I I'm not sure. And you guys are letting him get away with it. Many of you are just, uh, you know, complicit in this mess, but you live in it. This man has security. He lives at the White House. He has, he has armed guards protecting him every day from police harassment, and from getting shot while in a hoodie. What do you have? What you have is a vote for him and a denial over and over again in major forms that you are facing inherent systemic oppression. And I'm not sitting up here waiting on you to agree with me. I'm sitting up here stating facts the way they need to be stated. So President Obama sexes this up for Glozella, and that sounds good when you say it real fast. It sounds sexy when you say it real fast, but at the end of the day, I need for him to say this at the State of the Union and mean it. Not say it and just, just pretend as if that's what's going on here. Not say it and just, oh, well, maybe it's going on here. Say the same things you say, Mr. President, to BET that you say to the State of the Union. Say the same things. Be consistent. Don't niche your message. Don't, don't give it to black people just because black people are watching. Because her audience is black. Because BT's audience is black. Because you want to curry some favor with a black audience. Say it to everybody. Don't, don't pretend. Don't sit up here and pretend like it's not happening. Don't, don't, don't sit up here and pretend like you're, 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 it's raining outside when you're really peeing on all of us. And it just makes me sick. People just go along with it as if it's, if it's okay. That makes him a black face on a white problem. Systemic oppression has a name, and it's President Barack Obama. Systemic racial oppression has a name, and it's President Barack Obama. He continues it by denying that it exists. He continues it by continuing to placate these sick white racists out there who don't want to admit it, who make fun of Glozella Green and talk about how she uses popo, 
who is this character? Who is this woman talking about President Obama and the Popo in front of the President of the United States of America? She is up there talking about the Popo. Of course they deny that there's any racial bias. We're all the same. We're okay. It's okay that these police officers are beating your butt. It's okay that these police officers are kicking your rear end, that they've got their, they've got their glocks out every single time they ask you, you got any warrants or holds on you? What are you doing in this neighborhood? And President Obama continues this mess when he says, you know what, every community needs good policing. Well, why doesn't every community have police officers on every corner, watching to see if anything that they're doing is wrong. Because this doesn't happen, sir, again in Beverly Hills, and it doesn't happen a few blocks away from the White House in white communities in Northwest. But it definitely happens in Southeast. It definitely happens in the areas of Anacostia of Washington, D.C., where they are black people. Don't sit up here and pee on me and tell me that it's raining, Mr. President. All right, because what you're doing is feeding me a crock. And he's just, as we segue to the last story, this story about David Clark, he's a sheriff of Milwaukee County, where he talks about how Al Sharpton, with the DOJ investigation, and this is where I want to bring it home, that with the DOJ investigation, Al Sharpton needs to crawl back into the gutter. Long hair don't care. Needs to crawl back into the gutter where he came from. Here is what David Clark, Sheriff David Clark, had to say. We have got a Fox News alert. It's a case that divided the country and sparked violent protests all across the nation. And now the Department of Justice has confirmed the federal investigation out in Ferguson, Missouri, into Michael Brown's death is complete and civil rights charges against Officer Darren Wilson will not be brought. So is this legal evidence that the shooting was never about race to start with? Joining us right now with his reaction is Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark. Sheriff, good morning to you. Good morning. You know, uh, right after the grand jury came out and said uh, we're not going to indict him, there were there were people out there who were stirring the pot and saying that that young man was killed because he was black and the officer was white. And then you had Eric Holder going in and saying there's going to be a Department of Justice investigation. And now, you know, they're saying mm, no evidence of that. Your impression? Well, they knew this from the beginning. Uh, this whole thing was premised on a lie, this hands up, uh, don't shoot, this Black Lives Matter. Uh, the facts are the facts. I don't care who looks at them. They can have the world court look at it if they want, but the facts remain the same. The grand jury in Ferguson, Missouri got it right. Officer Wilson has been exonerated. The thing I want to know is how does he go and get his reputation back, or where does he go to get his reputation back? How do we put that toothpaste back in the tube? Absolutely. Eric Holder, uh, the president, Al Sharpton, all owe... You know, the city of Ferguson, Missouri, uh, uh, an apology. You told one of our producers in chatting with you yesterday that you feel that Eric Holder is guilty of race baiting. Why? Um, just take a look at the, the, the history here. Uh, this isn't the first uh, time that he has, has, has done this sort of thing. He sat up there for months just slandering law enforcement officers all across the nation. Uh, he's the one in Ferguson, Missouri, that brought up the uh, uh, racial profiling term and uh, that, that uh, we were going to end ro racial profiling once and for all, he said. He invoked that into this thing when that was never any part of what happened between, in you know, the tragedy between uh, Officer Darren Wilson mm -hmm. and Mike Brown. But again, uh, you know, this is kind of habit now for this Justice Department under Eric Holder, and I just think it's a shame. Well, I think the Justice Department felt like they had to do something because Al Sharpton, who is an advisor to the television, to the President of the United States was on television saying things like this at the time. How many people have to die right. before people understand this is not an illusion, this is a reality that America has got to come to terms with. This is going to be a winter that we're going to freeze out police brutality in this That's country. Right. Enough is enough. 
Well, news flash for Al Sharpton, no civil rights violation in Ferguson, Missouri. Sheriff, you get the final word. I don't expect anything intelligent to come out of the mouth of Al Sharpton. Uh, we all know that he's a charlatan. As a matter of fact, the next intelligent thing that comes out of his mouth will be the first. Al Sharpton ought to just shut up and go back into the gutter that he came from, apologize. He will not do that, but uh, the American police officer uh, is owed a lot from him, from Eric Holder, and from the President of the United States. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Sheriff David Clark joining us today from Milwaukee. Sir, thank you very much for your comments. My pleasure. Makes you mad, doesn't it? It makes you mad. It makes you angry. It made, made me a little angry. You know, you got a black officer. By the way, uh, Sheriff Clark is a black officer. You got a black officer up there. He's shucking in his job. He's, he's shucking in he, he's shucking in his job, and he's up on Fox News. You can tell, you know. The, the Department of Justice has decided this. You know, Dave Clark, what do you think about this? The Department of Justice, they, they decided this, and... You know, these niggers, they've been tripping all this time. These niggers, they've been tripping. They, they, this is what they do. They've been, they've been flipped out. They've been, they, they've been upset in Ferguson, tearing up stuff. They have, been, they, they have been burning down stuff, and they've been talking all of this mess, and here it is. We now know, Department of Justice, they're not going to do anything about any of this, and they have been blustering, and they've been race baiting, and he's like, yes, yeah, sir, mess, sir, yes, sir. That's exactly what they've been doing, Massa. Yes, sir. That's exactly. You got it exactly right. Yes, sir, Massa. You're right. You know, is my paycheck? Oh, it's in the mail. Okay, good. We sick, boss? Yeah, we, we, we sick. Okay, we sick. We sick. Okay, I'll be sick with you. What you want me to do now, Massa? Okay, I'll get up there on Fox News for you. And I'm going to sit up there and I'm going to tell, tell them what you want. What you want me to say now? Okay. Keep these niggers in check. Okay. This is just this is just a figment of their man. The, the racism and racial oppression that's going on out there. I agree with you, Fox News. It's just a part of race baiting by long hair, don't care, Al Sharpton. Sharpton, you know, keeping it real. You know, this man needs to go back into the gutter. He wants to say go back to Africa, but that's not part of the script that fits his phenotype. Because he's black too, and he'd have to go back to Africa, or at least he was black at one time. Let's just put it that way. And so we get upset, and I get upset at David Clark. I get upset, I look at it, and I get upset. I want to throw something at the computer screen. But then I start to realize it's my damn computer screen, and I don't need to buy another one. So I didn't throw anything at the computer screen. I just got upset with David Clark, just like you got upset with David Clark. And I'm going to tell you, here's the deal. David Clark and President Obama are not that far removed because they're telling you the same message. Isn't David Clark telling you the same message? That President Obama's telling you at the State of the Union? Isn't he telling you that, you know what, these, these matters are great, but we need unity. These matters, you know, we, we've got, yes, yeah, some people don't agree with the events of Ferguson, and some people will tell you that we're not sure what happened to Michael Brown and Eric Garner in New York. But we also need to understand that there are police officers that want their, 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 their family members, you know, to be safe, and that there are family members that want them to come home safely. And we need unity. The whole nation needs unity. Isn't that the same darn thing David Clark is telling you? Isn't that the same darn thing that, that, that David Clark is telling We need unity. These folks are dividing. Crawl back into the gutter from which you came, you little snake, you little weasel, Al Sharpton. Crawl back into the hairnet you you drug yourself out of this morning. Crawl crawl back in crawl back into the safety. All right, of that hairnet. Okay? When there was a hell of an admission in a report just a few months ago that we talked about on this show that President Obama told Al Sharpton, he said, I just want you to make sure you get these niggers under control. That's essentially what President Obama gave Al Sharpton as a charge. And Al Sharpton, as a fellow Democrat, as a fellow black part of the establishment, white supremacist establishment, said to President Obama, yep, I'll do what I need to do. And the conservative media told on itself by reporting getting mad that Al Sharpton has such unprecedented access to President Obama and civil rights leadership. But the expose that they ran really tells the story 
about how President Obama and Al Sharpton collude to try to placate the masses, how they collude to try to tamp down insurrections like we saw in Ferguson. Because these are nightmares for President Obama. They're nightmares for Eric Holder. They're nightmares for the government. And they can't control these Negroes because they don't go by that same Negro script of let's just go march and let's go home. And we're going to vote our way to freedom. See, voting our way put President Obama into office. Voting our way put President Obama up on the State of the Union talking about, hey, you know what? Everything's fine and we need unity. People might see this different ways and it's kind of gray and I'm not sure exactly what's going on. See, voting our way got us what we have with President Obama. That's what we have right now. That's what voting has done. That's why I keep telling you, I keep saying to you, why voting is not the only answer. The thing that got us recognition, the thing that got us some semblance of change and some semblance of a movement in the streets and millennials involved with hands up, don't shoot, with I can't breathe, with all of that was the fact that we actually had violence. What did France Fanon say? What did he say? What did Franz Fanon say via Dr. Lewis Gordon earlier this week? He said that there is not a revolution that can happen in any country that cannot somehow be tied back to violence. But what violence means, when you say violence and you're black, violence is only against white people. Many black people can die over and over and over and over again. It is possible, but time someone white dies, then it's violence, then it's a problem. And remember, there was something else that France Fanon said via Dr. Lewis Gordon reminding us of the talk. He said that, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people out there who talk about nonviolence, but these people actually commit violence by allowing young black men, I'm going to take it a step further, to die in the streets and do nothing about it, and to say that they support nonviolence as a retaliatory measure. You're actually complicit in said violence because you do nothing to actively stop it. And that's the reason why France Fanon, as Dr. Lewis Gordon says, gets a bad rap because people call him violent because he sought to do something about the violence against those people in the black community. I keep telling you, all of this is coming together. So as we look at this in the underview, as we conclude, the Department of Justice decides that it's not going to do anything or we think that that's what's going to happen. And President Obama gets up there with glozella green and says all of these wonderful things about what's going on in the black community and how there's bias against the black community via some police officers and how we need better training but all of this escapes the state of the union and he starts to sound more like david clark he sounds to 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 to, to stir things up like david clark and we accept that where he talks about essentially these civil rights Negroes need to sit down. We all need to join hands and sing together, and everything's going to be okay. And these black people, they're really just they're really just smoking crack. And this is not really happening because that's the same thing President Obama saying with the State of the Union when he talks about it's all gray. That's the same thing David Clark is doing when he talks about this. He's talking about it's all gray. And, oh, we, we don't know what's going on. Look, I don't want to see anybody get hurt. I don't. I don't want to see anybody get hurt, but I'm going to go back to something that is important for you to remember. You know, we we talked about so much this week. We talked about all of these issues, talked about the Oscars and some people and how they feel like they're tired of racial oppression. I said we've been dealing with racism for 400 years. 400 years. You could deal with four years of President Obama seeing a black guy in office. You could deal with eight years or four more years of President Obama being in office. You can you could deal with that. You're going to have to deal with it. If you don't want to deal with it, deal with it because that's what you're going to have to deal with. You can deal with it. It's going to be okay. 
You're not all right? You'll get all right. Don't worry about it. You know, that, that, that's okay. You know, people want to pretend as if racism isn't rampant. They want to pretend as if, you know, they're not black stories to tell, that, that, that black people don't have a plight, that we don't have issues that we should be seeing in cinema, seeing every day, and seeing them as they happen and admitting that it is what we see it as. It is racism, not that it's all in your head and you need some mental psychotherapy. You know, some kind of psychotherapy, some kind of psycho help. It's not all in your head. You're not going crazy. Your stories do have value in Hollywood and beyond. Hell, we can't even get a picture made about black violence in this country. Can't even, can't even get it discussed on the news. And our president won't even admit in popular forums that it exists. But in little niche, niche forums, he will. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. I don't. But here's the thing. We hurt ourselves. Like Franz Fanon said, we hurt ourselves when we don't do something. We're not proactive. When we don't push. See, it's not enough just to vote. I keep telling you, I talked about in words of change, why neither Obama nor the GOP can solve America's problems. I talked about it in Disruptor, Pathway to Political Independence. I talked about it in Not a Nonviolent Negro, How I Survived Obama. I talked about it in Hired Hatred. I talked about it in all these books, how it's not just enough to vote. We've got to change the system. I'm not trying to change these racist, white, supremacist ideas about black people. I'm not trying to change who they are. I want them to be who they are. The thing that I'm trying to change is you. Meaning the people that agree with what I'm saying and say to you, the individual, that we have to change the system. See, not changing the system gets us Obama. Not changing the system gets us a black head of the Academy of Film, Arts, and Sciences that says that, you know what, black films were overlooked and we need to do better in the future. Not changing the system gets us the David Clarks of the world. And they all speak with one voice because they speak with the voice of the oppressor. How else can they be there? Because the bourgeois class, like Frantz Fanon said, has been separated in this country from the movement. Those that arrive are rewarded for carrying the water. And because they are rewarded for carrying the water, they are now disconnected and so far discombobulated that they keep reading the same system script. We have to change the system. We have to continue to rage against the system. The system is the problem. No one individual can be the solvency here. President Obama cannot in itself, the White House cannot in itself be the solvency. We have to change the system, and that's what I've been saying over and over and over again. I'm about changing systems, not people, because right now we're cycling faces out of these organizations in and out, in and out, in and out, whether it's a police force, whether it's the academy, whether it's the presidency, and we're getting the same result. Until we change the system, will we truly see real change? Guys, I've had fun. I've got to run. If I'm not here, I'm there. There is ReadingNewsReview.com on the World Wide Web. That's Reading like Otis sitting on the dock of the bay, baby. NewsReview.com on the World Wide Web. I'm back your way Monday through Friday after 4 p.m. with more of Reading News Review Unrestricted.